it's just so beautiful. Like I like I said to you off camera, it just it it's it's a beautiful story, but it's it's Thank so you. filled with love and um, it's peppered with true facts, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Um, but the 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 romance, I guess I'll call it, is is. Um, it's it's out of this world, honestly. Oh, it really you. is so touching. So, now I mentioned it's peppered with true facts, and I was wondering if you would just take a moment to um, to throw out some of the numbers that are actually in the book about the diversion of water and what okay. that means. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it's the dawn of the hydroelectric era. Uh, for the Queenston Powerhouse, which is now Sir Adam Beck One, is being built um, over the course of the story. And when that um, powerhouse was being built, it dwarfed in a you know a, in a big way any hydroelectric development um, that already existed on the river, and it was much larger than anything that was contemplated anywhere in the world. Um, prior to the the well, at the time of um, the day the falls stood still, the Boundary Waters Treaty was in place between Canada and the America, and that set the amount of water that could be diverted away from the river and falls in order to fuel the plants that produce um, hydroelectricity. So at that time, um, the Boundary Waters Treaty limited the amount of water that could be diverted to be about 25% of the river's average natural flow. Um, uh, throughout the war, um, the power plants were instructed to divert water to the maximum they could because we needed um, the power to fuel munitions plants and, and the war effort really. Um, there was a couple of temporary agreements that came into place and then in 1950 the Niagara Diversion Treaty, Treaty came into place and that's the treaty that's still in, um, in existence today. And what it does basically is it, it um, sets the minimum flow over the falls at about 50% of the river's average natural flow during the daylight hours of tourist season and about 25% of the av river's average natural flow outside of, um, outside of those, those tourist hours. Um, so I don't think very many of the tourists today realize that when they're standing at the brink of the falls, they're you know, probably seeing only half the river's average natural flow and maybe seeing as little as um, 25%. That's staggering because the, the force that you do see going over there. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if there's, there's obviously been environmental studies for the hydro projects that are going right. on, but this must have some sort of impact on the ecosystem, would you think? Um, yeah, I mean the falls, the, the falls obviously looks very different than it did. When you, when you see old pictures of the falls, you can absolutely tell that there's more water going over in the, the old days. Certainly, um, the seniors around Niagara Falls will tell you the falls isn't what it used to be, and they'll tell you that the thunder's not as loud as it used to be, and the earth doesn't shake to the same extent that it used to, and those kind of things. Um, the, 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 we know, I mean, I suppose this is one of the, the, the benefits of, of um, the massive diversion of water is that the falls used to erode about four feet a year, um, erode back, and, and that, that's been slowed to about one foot a year um, because of the, the diversion of the water. Um, you know, I, I can say anecdotally, people have told me, and I mean, I think this is true, like Dufferin Islands, the water in there is, is, is stagnant. It used to, you know, it used to be a lovely pace to swim, but I th think there's less water flowing through there because there's less water in the river. Um, you used to see standing waves 30 feet in height in the Whirlpool Rapids, and you know now there's jet boating in the Whirlpool Rapids, so it's dramatically altered. Um, I think the, the, the river in the, the lower river, so below the falls, is about 10 feet um, lower in the gorge than it used to be, and you can see evidence of that when you look. You can, you can see places on the, the gorge walls where you can tell the river used to go up to. Amazing, and um, fingers crossed it doesn't mean anything you know, too detrimental, um, because obviously hydroelectricity is something that's 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 a positive. Right. But yeah. I mean, I think I'm satisfied with the current arrangement. I, yeah. I hope that there will never come a time where we decide that we want to divert more water away from the river and falls, or perhaps have no water going over the river and falls at night. Um, hydroelectricity is clean. Um, you know, no carbon emissions. Um, those are absolutely things we need to be looking at. I think the falls are still stunningly gorgeous. Uh, one concern I have is when you add up, well, today they're building another hydroelectric tunnel under the city of Niagara Falls, and um, that will up uh, Canada's diversion ca capacity by about 30%. 
And when you add up all the diversion capacity that exists on the Canadian side of the river and on the American side of the river, it adds up to about 93% of the river's average natural flow. So hence my sort of nervousness about where are we going with this and is there going to be a time where we're experiencing brownouts and we say, hey, I know how we can make more hydroelectricity. We won't have water going over the falls when the tourists aren't here or something like that. So. It seems to slip in that way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's the, the, historically it's been, you know, a, a steady increase in the amount of water that we're allowed to divert. And then up in about 1915, 1950, uh, we got the Niagara Diversion Treaty. Um, and, you know, we, we couldn't, we didn't have the ability to divert all the water we were allowed to in the, in the 1950 Diversion Treaty. But over the years, um, you know, Sir Adam Beck II has been built, um, the Robert Moses uh, Park, or the Niagara Power Plant on the American side of the river um, has been built. And then there's a lot of um, things that have been done along the way to, to figure out how to, you know, eke as much water, as, as much power as we can out of, out of the water that we are diverting. Wonderful. Um, your book opens um, at Loretto, right? And you mentioned Loretto really does exist. Yes. Um, and you're currently a founder of, for an organization that is working to preserve Loretto and Loretto's air, like the the right. green space around yes. it. Yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the organization? Okay. So Friends of Niagara Falls is a is a nonprofit conservation organization. Um, I helped found it. It's, we're currently focused on stopping the high-rise development that's planned for the seven acres of green space that surrounds Loretto Academy. Um, Loretto, the, 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 the green space, and much of it is tree, that surrounds Loretto Academy today forms the backdrop um, to the Horseshoe Falls, certainly when you're looking at it from the American side of the river and from many places on the Canadian side of the river as well. So. Um, you know, I feel that, um, and many others feel as well, that, uh, you know, tree green space forms a much better backdrop to a natural wonder of the world than a wall of, of concrete and glass. Um, there's other implications of building these high rises, like there will be certain times of the years when the shadows of the high rises fall right on the, the falls itself, interfering with the glorious spectacle of uh, the sun setting on the falls. Um, the Niagara Parks Commission did a study that uh, indicated that the, um, uh, since the high rises have gone up, the number of rain-like days at the brink of the falls have, have doubled, and um, the engineering consultants that they hired uh, to try to help them understand this phenomenon came to the conclusion that um, it's the, the high rises that are blocking in the mist and preventing it from clearing, so there, you know that's a consideration as well. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the, the, the one of the hotels that they're proposing is 57 stories, so that's about three times the height of the falls. So you can sort of imagine what that's going to look like. It will dwarf Niagara Falls. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it's actually taking my breath away hearing that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's actually I consider that a tragedy. So if people want to participate in, uh, there's a petition. And right. Yes, you can go on to uh, friendsofniagarafalls.org and there's a petition there that you can sign. There's a whole bunch of ways you can get involved on the Get Involved page. Um, yeah, so we, we look forward to having, um, you know, lots of support. Absolutely. And um, something I ask everybody who comes on the show is what has been your greatest inspiration in life? My greatest inspiration in life? Hmm. I think probably my greatest inspiration in life has been reading. Um, I was a big reader from an early age and it's uh, you know still something I absolutely love. Um, as a child I, I think the first book I fell in love with was James and the Giant Peach and I remember my teacher Miss Newell in grade four reading us that book and me you know thinking I couldn't possibly wait until 315 when she would start reading for you know the last 15 minutes of the days and of the day and then I think that the, the books that probably turned me into a reader, because Miss Newell was reading that book to us, were the Anna Green Gables series. And, um, you know, I think when I was 11 or 12 years old, I got turned on to those and I couldn't read them fast enough. And I've, I've been reading, you know, hardcore reader ever since. Um, and I think it's probably all that reading that, that, that led me to think that there was a possibility that I could, could write. Um, and, you know, this sort of life and that people are able, or this, these lives that people are able to, um, create for you inside your head. Uh, I think, you know, when you, as a reader, when you experience that so many times, you start to feel like maybe I can create that world for someone else. So. That's beautiful.